um, three things for this chapter, guys. It's a, it's a short chapter. It shouldn't take that long. Um, I have uh, requirements for circuits and outlets in a building. PowerPoint presentation. I have any sequence book, guys, right here. And also a couple of nice looking pictures that you guys uh, will be looking at. So that's kind of what I have the, uh, for you. So determine required number of grind circuits and feeders. I'm going to start the whole presentation, guys, actually with this picture, because I think it's, uh, it's a great picture to summarize if you want to understand the electrical systems. You guys have this picture right in your book, so if you guys, it should be right in your book. If you guys go there. Um, I always tell the people, guys, you shall not. Uh, Patrick, my friend, you cannot understand the electrical code unless you understand very three important circuits. Did you guys hear me? When you were with Polly and Jeff, Polly talked about uh, a series of parallel circuits. You guys remember that? A series of parallel combination circuits. And then the Steve ta uh, and Jeff talked to you guys about uh, brand circuit for motors. Now, when you get into the power design, and installation, you have to understand three very important circuits. You're going to be the code treat them differently. Starting with the utility transformer right here. This is electrical, electrical utility. Starting with your electrical utility transformer. So this is how you start the power. When you bring, uh, uh, Craig, my friend, when you bring the power into your building, you have to always start with a transformer, single phase or three phase, sitting outside. That's your start point. Everybody understand that one? That's your start point of coming to the building. You have to start with a transformer. Um, I don't care. I can't think of any place where you cannot start with a transformer given by the electrical, owned and operated and installed by whom? The electrical utility. This is called the service point. This is your service point. The point where you receive electrical service. Very, very important. Then, from the electrical utility, you bring a conduit. Can you guys see that? This is called service conductors. Service inference conductors or service conductors. <clears throat> um, these are the conductors that you pull in the conduit from the transformer into your building. Now, I'm going to highlight this one. Let's just say um, this is the point right here. This is the point right in this line here. This is electrical utility. This is owner. Are we still owner, right? This area is owner. You own it. This is owned by who? The electrical utility, right? Typically, right where the transformer is located, for the most part, the secondary side. Now, who's going to be putting these conductors and the conduit? You, the electrical contractor, electrical engineer. So when you bring the power to the building, you're going to put a conduit between the transformer that own and operated and installed by electrical utilities. You put the conduit and you pull your conductors. Right out of the secondary of the transformer, all the way to the panel. These conductors are called service entrance conductor. This is circuit number one. I want you guys to work on this. Circuit number one is the one that brings the power into the first panel from the transformer. Very, very important. We call them service entrance conductors. Service entrance conductors. Okay. And there's a whole article, article 232. In the MDC code book, handle this. There's a whole article about this. 230. Any comments, guys, questions about the service interest conductors? So when you when you hear the people talk about service interest conductor, this is the, a big fan of company for the most part. For instance, that's a big conduit like this. Is that a 405 or 6? If it's a, either a 405, I can't remember. I've been told, but what do you guys think? 404 or 8 I did the uh, wires at the uh, city of Princeton. Okay. Turn it off the, off the power line and do the transformer. That's another way of doing it. There are two ways of bringing the service conductor, guys. Either you bring in a big conduit like this, four inch, or you bring it directly into the power on the pole. These are called pad mounted transformers. They sit them on a concrete pad, or they sit them on the pole. And they bring a wire, right? That's what they do residential. They bring the power from a transformer, pole mounted, they call it pole mounted, into the house, overhead. Okay? Uh, Underground. Building, yep. So, either, so when you have a transformer, that's what they say, you're going to have 
have either a pad phone case sitting on a concrete pad on the floor, typically in a commercial building, that's what you get. The residential typically have a pole mounted, big pole transformer, bring the power. Okay, so this point, guys, right here is your service point where you get your service. The utility or the transformer, you own the conduit and the cable, you bring them into a panel. This panel, guys, is called service, service panel. Service entrance panel. The first panel or main panel. Service entrance panel, main panel. Okay. So that's, that's called the service entrance conductors. The second circuit is this circuit, right? Number two, can you just see that? This circuit right here. This circuit is called the feeder. When you take a conduit and a wire from the main panel into a sub panel, the conductors are called what? Feeders. And the article that talks about them is 215. Article 215 talks about feeders. The article 215 talks about feeders. Okay, so what is a feeder? A feeder is basically a conductor, multiple conductors between two panels. That's what a feeder. When you hear people talk about feeder, and um, and branding in the industry and at Mishad and everywhere else, people use the word feeder wrong. They say I am sending a feeder to the chiller. That's technically not a feeder. That's a brand circuit. Okay, so be aware that people use them kind of uh, wrongly. A feeder is between panels. Take the rate. Between two panels, that's called the feeder. Okay, now when you reach the second panel, <coughs> you're going to say AC unit. Here's my AC. This is my pump. Uh, light. All of these are called circuit number three, guys. It's called branch circuit. All of these are branch circuits. So what is a branch circuit? Branch circuits is the wires between the last over competition device, the fancy name for a circuit paper, and the utilization equipment. The utilization equipment. Any comments, any questions about guys about these three very, very important circuits? And the article that talks about these is uh, uh, 210. The article for brand circuit is 210. So we have three articles Article 210, Article 215, and Article 230. These are related to service entrance conductors, feeders, and brand circuits. So moving forward, if I ask you guys here, all these circuits here. Now the feeder that's coming to this panel, the conductor that's coming to this panel, are they feeder or branch circuit? Feeder. If you understand the difference between them, guys. So the first one is the main and then the second one is like sub panel. Yes, this is yeah, this is called sub panel typically. So you go between a sub panel and a service panel or main panel. We call it main panel, service panel. These are feeders. You know, you know the main. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's why some people don't have it. They call it, this is called main lugs only, meaning there is no circuit breaker main in it. The reason why they don't put it is just because they save money. Okay, so you can see this guy has no main. Well, it looks like they're landing in here lugs, and the main is coming out of this circuit breaker. Any comments, guys? Any questions about these very important three circuits? Service entrance conductors. Feeders and branch circuits. The second thing I want to mention, guys, branch circuits and feeders must always start with an over current friction device. You can't pull a branch circuit or a feeder without a circuit breaker or a fuse. So let's start right here. Can you guys see these? These are, right here, these two together are your circuit breaker to protect the feeder. Now let's start with here. All these are also circuit breakers. To protect the branch circuit. Can you start a branch circuit without a circuit breaker or a fuse? No. Can you start a feeder without a circuit or a fuse? No. Now, can you start a service entrance conductor without a service and a fuse? Yes. You're, these see that these conductors coming in here, right here, in the conduit, they're protected by typically a fuse on the primary side of the transformer or an operator's light or utility. That's why the service conductors are always kind of hot potatoes when people service conductors. Oh, don't touch them. They're dangerous, more dangerous than anything else. Why? Because they're fused by the utility at a higher level. They're not protected as good as the feeders and the branch circuits. Put it this way. 
So any comments, guys, any questions about these three articles? One more time. We have one article, 210, for red circuits, 213 for feeders, and 230 for overcome shipwrecks. And we'll talk about these guys in details, but for the time being, you have to understand that there are three different circuits. So when I say feeders from now on, the term feeder meaning between two panels. Grand circuit between the circuit breaker and the loss of overcompetition device. Now, here's a question for you. I, ha I have an air handling unit, and I'm taking 600 amp to feeder. Is this a branch circuit or a feeder? 600 amp, 480 to feed an air handling unit on the top, on the, on the, on the rope. Branch circuit or feeder? Branch circuit. So it's very, very clear. Okay, does that make sense, guys? Now, can I take a branch circuit from the main panel? Can I take a circuit breaker right here and feed a chiller? Sure, no problem. Can I take the circuits and feeders from any panel? Can I take another circuit breaker here and feed another panel? Yeah, sure. You know, it, it, the panel has to be sized appropriately, but you can have a branch circuit or a feeder from any panel. Something off a main circuit? Would you need another circuit breaker? From here? Yeah. Yes. You always have to have a... At the beginning of every feeder, you have to have a circuit breaker. That's a must. Okay. Comments, guys, questions about how we bring power to the building. We have a transformer, head mounted or pole mounted. We have a conduit, typically either underground with conduit to the wire or overhead with service conductors. We're bringing it to the first panel called the services service panel. From it, we take feeders and branch circuits. I want to bring your attention, guys. Every time you bring the service conductor, you must land on a disconnect. The first circuit breaker, the main circuit breaker, is called service entrance disconnect. That's a fancy name for it. The legal name for it. Now, Pat, we can call you Pat, but probably the legal name is Patrick. So that guy, you can, you can call him a circuit breaker, right? No problem. But his legal name is service entrance disconnect means. <laughs> Look, am I making sense? The first circuit breaker in the panel the legal name for that guy is service dis service entrance disconnect means, and it's you have to have one. You ca you can't just get rid of that guy. Service entrance disconnect means fancy name, or a cert I mean circuit breaker. So be aware of that one. So here's my question for you, Brandon. Um, do you can you have a main lines only main panel be main lines only? No. Well, you can you know. I can have a minimum on the jet, but I can put my circuit breaker three disconnects right here. That's okay. Right? If you if you use a main lugs only, like a panel like this, if you use it as a service panel, that's fine. As long as you get right on the top a fuse disconnect. So you can have a disconnect and a fuse in it. So but typically what we do we have a main circuit breaker. Okay, comments, question guys about that? Okay. Yes, sir. Um, we do a lot of work on the uh, transformers and factories. All those sites and have about eight to ten of those in, in the cabinet for the for the main power. It's called switch gear. Okay. Yep. We are coming, guys, and we'll mix things together. When we panels, they're different type of panels. You start the cheapest thing is called load center. That's what you have in your house and mine, up to 200 amp. You go higher than 200 amp, and you go at three phase. They call they call it panel board. You're looking at a panel board right here. And panel boards can go up to 1,200 amps, any voltage you want. 208, single phase, three phase, 1,200 amps. Higher than 1,200 amps, they move into something, look at the amps becoming bigger. They move into something called switchboard. A switchboard, I can describe it as basically refrigerator size sections. Each one of them is large refrigerator size switchboard. That can get you up to 5,000 amps. Now there's a fancy switchboard Fancier switchboard has these big boards in it, draw out like these. They call it switch gear. That's also the way they look. They look like the largest refrigerator that you can imagine. Each one of them is one section. Imagine 12 of them side by side, and each one of these refrigerators is carrying forks. Typically, they have forks, they have magnet forks. And they have a gear. So these are your circuit breakers. Here's the section right here. So you have them. Um, you have a very specific section that's very switch to one system. So anyway, we'll get into that one. That's just a, another panel, but bigger, bigger amps. It's still, by the way, it's still the same. 
It doesn't, it doesn't change it. The amp changes. Okay. All right. With these guys, I want to... So that's kind of where I want to start. My start point. Um, with the branch circuits and the feeders. So let's go directly into this. And um, so all of this guys is to this chapter determine the required number of branch circuits. Now we know what a branch circuit is, right? We need to know in a house, how many branch circuits do you need in a house? That's what you're going to learn from this, this one. And how many lighting outlets do you need in a house? And how many receptacles do you need in a house? This is the goal of this chapter. To how many branch circuits you need in a house or a dwelling, how many receptacles, and how many lights. Am I making sense, guys? Branch circuits, receptacles, and lights. Okay? All right. So that's the first the first thing. Um, so understanding the requirement for branch circuit, and then get all branch circuits. How do you size them? And add a load to them. We'll talk about this one, guys. And then understand the term volt amp per square foot. Volt amp per square foot that we're going to be talking from any secret book. That's how we size them. Uh, cal calculate the occupied floor. You guys remember the table? I'll show you a table. There's table uh, 220.12. The smarter than Chad allocated a volt amp per square foot for different occupants. And they say, hey, we've been doing this for years. If you have a house, Take the square foot of your house, multiply it by three, and that will get you the allocated volt amp for your house. That's it. And we, I, you guys highlighted 320.12. That's called the uh, volt ampere square foot. Um, we need to also, we'll talk about the minimum. The maximum is, uh, is always the sky. The minimum number of lighting and, uh, and laundry brake circuits and kitchen and what's not, and the outlets. In terms of receptacle outlets and lighting outlets, receptacle lighting outlets, how many receptacle lighting outlets you need in one house? All right, let's start with the branch circuit. You guys know what a branch circuit is, right? We just talked about it. Here's the definition circuit conductors between the final overconfiction device and the outlet um, and the outlets or the utilization equipment. The, the final overconfiction device and uh, the utilization equipment. That's how they define it. So here's the circuit paper right here, gentlemen, and all the way up to a light, or another one here going to a receptacle, or a third one going to AC. All these are branch circuits, protecting, and they all start, can you guys tell me what they always start with? Every branch circuit must start with circuit, circuit breaker. breaker. You can't just pull a branch circuit and say, well, the heck with it, no circuit breaker. That's your circuit breaker. Feeder. The feeder, guys, is basically fancy uh, words is between panels. They call it all circuit conductors between service equipment. Look at the word service equipment. The source of circuit in your system uh, or other power supply sources and the final branch circuit of competition device. Um, so these are called branch circuits. So I have two panels, you can look at this, two panels, uh, feeding, that's called a feeder. Um, I have a transformer, look at this, I have a transformer. I'm feeding a transformer, XFR, coming out of the transformer. These also guys called feeders, feeder, feeder. When you have a transformer, we'll talk about this in an industrial. When you have a transformer that you own, an op you own and operate in your building, this is also feeders. Going through the transformer, out of the transformer are called feeders. Any comments, guys, about the feeders? So far, for you guys, since this is residential commercial, we don't have transformers that we want to operate. These are the feeders between two panels. But also, could, the feeder could be between a transformer that you own and operate. You can see the difference between this transformer and the one that I just draw. This is I own and operate. And the reason why you use this is because when you have a 480 volt system and you need two waves, what do you need to do? You have to put the transformer that you own and operate, not the electrical utility. So feeders and branch circuits. <clears throat> um, there's something called ambicity that is very, very important, guys, to understand. Um, current carrying capacity of a conductor. The ambicity is called the current carrying capacity of a conductor. Must not be less than the overconfiguration device that protects it. Um, Motor circuit, some exception. So now when you size the branch circuit, when you size the branch circuit, it's very simple, guys. Let me sh sh show you how simple the branch circuit sizing is. Um, 
let's just say you have a circuit here and you have 10 amps. You have a circuit that is 10 amps, not continuous. Now we have to get into the continuous, not continuous. If it's continuous, it runs for three hours continuously, it's continuous. If it doesn't run for three hours continuously, it is non continuous. So if you have a non continuous, non motor, non continuous, non motor, and you need to size a black circuit for this mode, look how simple that is. There's my conductor. You have to start with what? Circuit breaker. Okay? So 10 amps. What's the next standard over current protection device for the 10 amps? Do you guys know 15 amps? They don't make in the US 10 amps. We make 10, 20. Uh, 20, uh, 10, uh, I mean 15, 20, 25, I'll show you where they find it. So now this is going to be a 20 amps, right? Why? Because it has to be 10 or more so it can handle that guy. I'm sorry, this would be 15, the next standard. The next standard would be 15 amps. Okay, now I need a conductor that can handle 15 amps. I'll show you where to find the conductor in a second, guys. That's number 14. Number 14. Gentlemen, we have just sized a brand circuit for a more 10 amps. Non continuous. See how easy that is? That's how easy. When you size a bright circuit, here, first you have to find over temperature device. This is first. Second, you have to have a conductor size. Second. Now, how many conductors? This is single phase. Single phase. How many conductors for single phase do you need? Single phase. Two, hot and a neutral. So, how many numbers? 14. So, that will be. Um, number 14 slash 2 and um, am cable. If I will use an am cable, gentlemen, we are looking at where they go, right here. We're looking at that wire. <laughs> That's it. Here's the two. Remember, do we count that ground? We talked about that yesterday. Don't count the ground. 14 2. Here's 14 2 and am cable. Now, if I, if I will use AC cable or MC cable, would it make a difference? Absolutely not. The sizing. If I were to use a wire and a conduit, a rigid conduit like this and a wire, and wire that, would it make a difference in terms of sizing? No. Am I making sense of this? So, to wire this load, you can literally, in this, you can probably have 30 ways of wiring this load. 30 different wiring methods that can wire this load. Any comments, guys? Any questions about this? So, the conductor, there's something called the current phase capacity of the conductor. We'll talk about it here. The ambicity. When you hear the word ambicity, the current current capacity of a conductor. I'll show you this one in less than a second here. Okay, do me a favor. <coughs> Please go to 240.6. In the NEC control, go to 240.6. Please highlight it. Highlight this section 240.6 in the NEC control. Now, if you guys go to 240.6, okay, 240.6, you when you go to 240.6, please highlight this, 240.6, okay, do you guys see it, it says uh, the sizes, standard sizing in the U.S. that we use for circuit breakers, I want somebody to read me the first one and the last one, what's the first size that you start with? 15 amps. What's the last size way at the bottom they start with? 600. 600 or 6,000? 6,000 amps. Now, Brandon, if anybody wants, if you, when you size, if you want to go size a brand circuit or feeder over capture device, where do you go to find the standard sizes of over capture device and feeders? 240.6. 240.6. Right to 7 amps. So, <laughs> got it? 240.6. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Now moving forward, let me ask you. I want to ask you. I want to. My load is non-continuous, and it's 61 amps. And I want to size a branch circuit for it, non-continuous. So I go to the next standard, 61 amps. Can anybody find me a branch circuit over capacitive device for 61 amps? What's the next standard? Good. Look at it. 70. Right? Is there 65? No. Can you go down to 60? No, because your load is 61. You have to go to the next standard, which is 7. You guys see how easy that is? The branch circuits. Now, the branch circuits we, we, that we use for residential are very common. They're very simple branch circuits. Let's start with the 15 amps. 15 amps you feed for receptacle and light. 15 amp circuits is willing when feeding for receptacle and lights. 20 amp branch circuit. 
Linear drag circuits typically <laughs> receptacles only in blurring, not commercial. In commercial, the reason to get to understand in a commercial, we don't typically we don't use 15 hertz frame rate. It's not worth to use 15 hertz frame rate. Right. So, in the residential receptacles, <laughs> 15 amp is for lighter receptacles. The 20 amps are for receptacles. I call them special. Special. Um, 30 amps, can you guys write yourself for dryer? 50 meters for dryer and AC. So in your house, you go to your house, guys, the AC, if you have an electrical dryer, not gas, if you have an electric dryer, you will, it will be fed from a 30 amp circuit breaker, typical, and will. And if you have an AC, go to your AC, you have an, uh, um, an outside central air um, for a dwelling, that will be a 30 amp circuit. How do I know that, guys? This is typical. They use in dwellings. Remember, dwellings are a lot of typical. All right, let's say 40. 40 and 50. These are, anybody can guess? Range. 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 <laughs> and stoves, which is basically range. So if you have an electric range like I do in my house, the minimum that you can go is 40 amps. Huh? It's a stove with an oven. A range is a fancy name, guys, for having a stove at the top or a cook unit at the top and an oven or two at the bottom. So, standing up. So, you know, you have uh, two ovens here, right? So, here's oven, oven one, oven two, and then right here you have the uh, the stove top, the stove top, thank you, the stove top. The stove top with the two ovens or one oven, that's called a range. One oven is not a range. Two, a stove top by itself is not a range. You can see what a stove is. is the, uh, uh, an oven is the stove top as well as one or two ranges in one big. Um, Oh, yeah, thank you, not gas. If it's gas, all what you need, just plug it into a 15 amp circuit for the control. These are all electric. Same thing for dryer. If you have a gas dryer like I do, all what you need is, is a 15 amp just to run the motor for a dryer. These are electric. When I say electric, guys, meaning you burn electricity. Everything is electric. A gas dryer is electric because you need to run the motor. But an electric dryer is you run the motor and the heating element in the dryer using the system. Any questions guys about these are the uh, one, two, three, four, basically four circuits they're going to use in the residential project. <laughs> so your residential project from now, the residential one, is going to be either 15 amp, 20 amp, or 30 amp or 40 amp from the get-go, your grand circuits. Okay, gentlemen, <clears throat> please write yourself a note. With 15 amp, we always use gauge 14. With a 20 amp, the gauge that I use, anybody? 12. Gauge 12. With 30 amps, anybody? Gauge 10. With 40 amps, anybody? Gauge 8. Write yourself a note, and gentlemen, you have just sized everything in the residential project. Everything in the residential project have got sized. <laughs> right? From the get go. No calculation, nothing. These are the typical sizing that we do. So if your brand circuit is 15 amp, minimum 14. Your 20 amp, minimum 12. If 30 amp, minimum 10. If 40 amp, minimum 8. 40 and 50, 8 will cover you for 50, 40 or 50. If you guys know that, you have just sized everything in the residential project. Done. 30 amps is number 10. Number 10. Any comments, any questions, gentlemen? So important to know these brand circuits. Because remember, ultimately, you're stuck in here's a brand circuit. Okay, here's a 15 amp, here's a 30 amp. From the get go, going to an AC. What size conductor do I need for 30 amp, gentlemen? 10. <laughs> Number 10. How many conductors, gentlemen, do I need for this AC? You're going to look at me and say, okay, Ted, is this single phase? Yeah. Is it two 120? They don't make ACs 120, like sit alone with 30 amps. They're typically, they're 240. They run at two watts. 
So this guy, I have to tell you, this is a two-story wall, meaning it's funny, it's two hots, no neutral. So how many conductors do I need? If there is two hots, no neutral. Two. Well, you don't count the ground. So two, two conductors. So this will be two conductors, number 10, John. And the ground. Can I get you guys from the get-go? Don't. The, the neutrals always, always goes without discussion. So when I say how many conductors, you give me the hot, the two hots and the neutral and, and the ground at the end. So in reality, there will be how many conductors here? Three conductors, one for the ground. But the ground will don't count. The reason why they don't count the ground is because if you increase the price, you see the ground like this? No, you don't need the ground. That's why the ground is coming on one fire and temperature. So if you're using a cable, you need a ground? Yeah. So the ground is, sometimes you need it. If you have a pipe, you don't need it. So it comes at the end. Okay, you guys got that one. Uh, 310.15 B16. Let's go look at this table. This is how you find the adversity um, of this table. Uh, I'm sure you guys used it a little bit. So let's go. I'm going to go to the stock view, walk you there. And and if you, you're going to learn it from your friend Chad. And um, thank you. Let's go to that table. This is must know, guys. Um, uh, chapter three and uh, three. Oops, three ten. There you go. Okay, so let's go to this table and zoom on it because it's um, right in here. Okay, can you guys see? Is this three ten dot fifteen b sixteen? Everybody can see that. Okay. Now, if you're in the electrical industry and you don't know this table, it's like being a Minnesota who grew up, raised up here, and you don't know what the twin cities are. And if they say what the twin cities are, you say it's Richfield and Bloomington. Right? Because we're next to each other. Well, how, how dumb that would be. That's literally how dumb if you're in the electrical industry and they say 3 to 15 to 16 and you don't know it. That's exactly living in Minnesota, born and raised up, and you're 50 years old. And, and they say twin cities, and you say it's Richfield and Bloomington. <laughs> That's, does that make sense, the gravity of not knowing that table? Okay, I like this table. You must know right in here, please, from the get-go. <laughs> you're going to live with this table forever, guys. You're going to live, live with this table forever. That's how you find how much current conductors can carry. Okay. So let me let me walk you guys through it. The first and the most important thing is this is for not more than three carrying conductors. Can you guys see that? So if you have highlighted, if you have more than three hots in a pipe, you have to use it, but you have to adjust it. Okay. The second thing you have to pay attention to, guys, right underneath there, this is for an ambient temperature of 86. Now we go to Arizona. And the ambient temperature, do you think it's 86 in Arizona outside? Ambient temperature is outside. 100 plus. 100 plus. So what do you need to do when you use this table? You have to adjust it. You can still use it, but you have to adjust it. Am I making sense? So typically, if you're sizing using this table in, in inside the building, guys, no problem. I mean, in Minnesota, the ambient temperature in Minneapolis is 90. Is um, assumed 90. So it's slightly higher than 86. Um, so if you're high, if you're sizing for system inside the, uh, the building, most of the buildings, the temperature doesn't reach 90, uh, 86. Typically, you, you, you control it. doesn't reach 86, typically. Um, yes? Are you looking at, um, oh, now there are two types of temperature that drives people nuts. So get it now and understand it. There are two temperatures in this table. Temperature number one, guys, is the temperature rating of this insulation. See that? So if I take this is the exception, if I go and I start heating this and, and it's not burning, right? Put, um, you know, put it on the, on the range and burn that insulation. When you reach temperature, THHN, when you reach temperature 90 degrees Celsius or 194 Fahrenheit, when the insulation reach 194 Fahrenheit, it stops burning. So that's the temperature, melting temperature of the insulation. Am I making sense? Okay. Now this guy, these are what looking in the green. These are the melting temperature. You're looking at them right in here. And this guy and up to this guy, Fahrenheit or Celsius. What are they? These are the melting temperature of the conductors. So they can come in three categories. Either, uh, I always know them in, in Celsius. 
high fat is 60 degrees or 75 or 90. You're going to hear these all the time, Celsius. And equivalent to them is Fahrenheit, right next to them. This guy you guys are looking at, it's 90. THHN is considered 90. What does that mean? I can meet this guy, the THHN, carrying the temperature reach 90 degrees Celsius or 194 Fahrenheit before the smoke starts coming out. Everybody understand this temperature? Cool. Now let's go to the next temperature. The next temperature is this guy here, the 30 and the 86. That's the ambient temperature, the room temperature. Right? Ambient temperature. That's your ambient temperature. So ambient temperature are given by ASHRAE, the Society of Mechanical Engineers in, in, in the US. They call design temperature. We have a list, guys, I can give it to you in Minneapolis, for example. It's not the highest temperature, and it's not the lowest temperature, the average temperature. It's basically the average temperature. Average temperature in Minneapolis, based on ASHRAE, is 90 degrees in Minneapolis. In Minnesota, guys, it fluctuates around 90, all over the state of Minnesota. So the, the state of this is 84 all the way to 90. That's kind of depending where you are in the state. So you go to Arizona, you expect it to be different, right? You know, it's hot. So that's the ambient temperature. Difference between ambient temperature and the conductor temperature. Clear? We're coming. We're coming. So you hold your horses. Now we're coming to the temperature adjustment. Okay. Now, which we have the three columns? You guys are familiar with this table. This table is first, the first set of columns is can you see copper? Yeah. And the second one is what? Aluminum. <laughs> Have you used this table before? Yeah. You have used it, okay. So the first set is copper, the second set is aluminum. Now, which car am I gonna use? Typically, you default to copper unless you know otherwise. Okay, so let's work on the copper side. In the copper side, guys, you can use 60, 75, or 90. You cannot, shall not, will not use 90 except if you're derating. So can you guys write your seven notes right here? This is only for derating. Purposes. Only for derating purposes. What's derating? If your temperature, like we just said, is higher, then you can use the THHN to derate, to cut. That's only for derating. Okay. Your option are using 60 or 75. This is your option. Either using 60 or 75, basically, for sizing. So, which conductor, which column are you going to use? If you're an engineering firm, and if your system is three phase, listen to me carefully. If you're an engineer firm and you're designing system and it's three phase, 99.9% of the time, you're going to be sizing where? Right here. That's the column they're going to be using 99% of the time, the 75 degree column. It's, it's guys, it's based on the, the three phase, basically. I'm going to show, there is um, a piece of equipment. This is my log. Is my conductor, is another log, and here's a circuit breaker. Here's a, a, let's just say a 15 amp circuit breaker. This is my log, and these are my logs, right? Everybody knows what a log is. They tie it and kind of connect the wire underneath it. When you size conductor, when you size a conductor, it's based on three things. Number one, the conductor temperature. So uh, give me a temperature for this conductor. So let's here's your temperature. If you're using TW or UF, these are rated, the temperature conductor 60. If you're using uh, RHW, THHW, THW, the temperature is what? 75. If you're using THHN, where are we here? THHN, uh, THW-2, the temperature is what? 90. That's what the temperature. So, I want to pick one for you guys. The temp I'm going to be using a TW. TW conductor, okay? The logs. Now the logs on the circuit breaker here, it's rated for 75, 75 degree column. How would you get, know what the logs are rated for? That's UL. The UL circuit breaker guys, 99% of the new circuit breakers are all rated for 75. So the logs, when you look at this, that log here, the log right here, and the circuit breaker here, it tells you 75 degrees. So now I'm going to go to the logs of the equipment. The logs of the equipment here, the equipment manufacturer will tell you, but three phase, if you're three phase, it's typically 75. So let's just say this log was single phase and it was rated for 60 degree column. Okay. 
Now, this one is 60 degree. This is 75, this is 60. They call it the weakest link. The weakest link is the lowest temperature. Which one is the weakest link? 60. So when you size the load, let's just say non-continuous load and uh, uh, 31 amps. Non-continuous load, 31 amps. Which column are you going to go to? Why six? One second. You can't go to 60 and 75 because that is the temperature of the conductor is what? 60. CW, is CW here? It forces you to go to 60. Okay, so for 31 amps, let's go find a conductor that can carry 31 amps. Let's say. Uh, 31 amps will be what? Number eight one. Number eight. Number eight can carry up to 40 and I need 30, so this conductor will be what? Number Eight. Good. Now look at the little change that I'm going to make. Am I making sense? Making sense, right? Number eight. Now look what I'm going to change. Now no engineer would be done to put TW conductor. We use guys THHN, THHW. So I'm going to change the insulation now. Look what I'm going to do. I'm going to go change my insulation from TW to THHN, which is the most typical insulation that we use. Okay. Now this would be the, the temperature is what? 90 degrees Celsius. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask the manufacturers or ask to change the logs here. I'm gonna change this log into 75 degree column. Typically we don't change the logs, but I'm gonna buy a piece of equipment and I know the logs are 75. Under these circumstances, I have 75, 75, 90. Which column can you go to and why? 75, yeah, 75, because my lugs are both 75, the conductors are 90, I can't use 90 except for durating, so you always have to go to 75. 90 is a no touch except for durating. Move all the way guys down into 75. So let's go sign the conductor itself. Now my conductor under these circumstances is what? Number 10. You can see how the conductor side will be different depending on what type of insulation you use. The one that I did in blue is the typical one the engineers do. I, the green one is, you know, rarely if ever use a TW. Any comments, guys? Any questions about that? Yes, sir. So we were doing our motor. We had to refer to 240, 24. If they're 10, aluminum or copper standard, the only one goes 25. Thank you. I'm coming to this one. That's called small conductor rules. Give me one second. The small conductor rules. There's a, a rule that's called small conductor rule. Just if you can give me one second, I'll, I'll go over that. Any comments, guys, about how to go, though? So your your engineers, 99% of the time, going to be in a 75 degree column. You specify the cables. We specify the cables. We're not electricians where things are shoved or thrown. We specify the THHN conductor all the time. Typically, guys, there's two insulation. They have THHN slash THW. That's kind of the common insulation that we use. So why do we specialize THHN slash THW? So THHN slash THW, guys, you always wear it. Right here. Here's the THHN. Um, so when you use, here's THW, and here's my THHN. So you see, <coughs> if you get slack, like the insulation that they typically use is THHN slash THW. If it has a W in the name J, it stands for wet. So it means if I can't take this conductor right here, gentlemen, I can install it outside in the conduit if it has a W in there, or I can install it right here. That's why we like the THHN slash THW. Because if I'm doing it outside, it's very high. If I'm doing it, if, if the conductors are outside, they will be rated for 75. If they're inside, they will be rated for what? THHN, right? So that's how they rate these conductors in terms of temperature. Okay. Any comments, guys, any questions about these, these tables before we go into a, how to use this table? So as engineers, guys, our default is 75 in the commercial industrial building. In dwelling, though, in dwelling, you have to pay attention to the logs. In dwelling, you have to pay attention to the logs. Okay, there's a rule that's called, um, I'm going to highlight this one, called small conductor rule. And they are actually highlighted right here for them. Small conductor rules starting right anywhere. Please highlight them. Okay? These are called small conductor rules. 
no matter what your calculation can tell you, no matter what your calculation can get, tell you, if you have a potential number 14, you shall not put more than a 15 amp circuit breaker on it. No matter what all this calculation that I'm going to be doing with you. These are called small conductor rules. The reason why they do them, uh, Craig, my friend, is because these are the most commonly branch circuit, uh, circuit breakers used. Look at them, 15, 20, and 30 amps, the most common. Uh, lighting and, and, uh, and branch circuits used in the industry. So they don't want you to go don't overload it for safety purposes. They don't want you to go to 20. Look at this. Number 14 can carry what? 20 amps under 75, right? Look at this. Number 14 can carry how much? 20 amps. But you can't use 20 amps out of it. So it's, the code says if you look at the star right underneath at the bottom, it refers you to the uh, section. If you read the section, it will tell you no matter what your calculation tells you, do not, do not, below these, do not put circuit breakers larger than 15, 20, and 30 amps on these conductors. Am I making sense? Why safety? These are the most common receptacle and lighting branch circuits used. The most common receptacle and branch circuit used. So, um, now look at this. Number 10 can carry. 35 amps. Can I get 35 amps out of number 10? No. Why? Small conductor rules. 240. Dot, uh, whatever that section. That's four. Uh, way at the bottom, guys. See the stars here? The double star. They put at the bottom. There's a note underneath there. I should probably scroll down a little bit. Right here. Can you guys see where it says refer to 240.4D for conductor over current protection limitation? There are limitations. Can you guys see that? There is a limitation. Any comments, guys? Any questions about the conductor? If you're doing aluminum, the small conductor rules are this. Look at the aluminum. God forbid to use these. If you're using number 12 aluminum, you're limited to 25. And if you're using number 10, you're limited to 35. Uh, um, no, I'm going to the 90. No, it should be right here. Uh, You can see that. If you're doing aluminum, there's your limitation. Number 12 cannot cannot be protected more than one amount. 15 amps all the way And if it's uh, number 10, you can't protect it more than one. 25 amps, even worse. So why would you use aluminum on brand circuit? We typically don't use aluminum brand circuit. Peters, yes, but brand circuits are tougher. Yes, for existing. Yeah, but you can't use them on devices or for branch circuit. The only feeders. Cheaper and lighter. That's the advantage of aluminum. It is cheaper and lighter than copper. Uh, the disadvantage, of course, they loosen a lot. They, they expand and contract more, which becomes loose connection and loose connection arcs and sparks. That's why if you want to give a, an engineer a heart attack, just mention aluminum three times in the front of them. Electrical engineer, not any other engineer. Any comments, guys, about this um, uh, this table? The last thing I want to I want to tell you guys about this table, and then we'll move into and we will be using this table guys a lot as we go through. Um, this is basically going to like I said, this is a twin series, so you got to know that. Um, yeah, the rifle we just tried. Yep. Um, remind me of that again. What was the side? What was the lower? 31 amps. Okay, so it was 31 amps. Yeah. And we need to size 31. It came over 10, but if you were further down, you go to 8, right? Yes, thank you. Because of the small conductor rule. So if, you, if I put number 10 here, I am limited to 30 amps. I have to limit it to 30 amps. You're absolutely right. So if it's a 31 amps, guys, if you put number 10, you're limited to 30 amps. You have to go up, up this one to what? Number 8. In order to get to um, your next 10. Typically, you're going to start with 
your next standard over temperature device will be what? After 31, 35. 35 amps, or that would be the number. Right? Those are going to go to the next standard over temperature device. Okay, there's one divider I would like you guys to write and then I'll move away from here. Um, right to a seven notch, right here. I always like to try to write this. Yeah. Um, right divider right here. And the way I do it is this way. And then anything higher, I box them in. Anything higher than this, it goes all the way with this. Oh, it goes all the way with this. Uh, with this. So, you are, the way you are list the equipment, guys. If you have a piece of equipment that need a conductor number one or smaller, number one or smaller, you are listed, give it a 60 degree long. Where would you find this? 110.14. 110.14. Um, not 14. 110.14 tells you this. So, for your default, guys, if your conductors are 8 feet to number 1, where do you default? 60 degree column. If your conductors are larger than number 4, you're defaulting into, um, into the 75 degree column. So, 75. This here is 60. Unless you know otherwise. Let me rephrase. Unless they tell you what the lugs are rated for. If you have no idea what the lugs are. No idea. Piece of equipment came from China. No idea what the lugs are. Look at it. What type of conductor do they require? Well, they require conductor number one. If it's number one, then it will go to 60. If it's number one out, 75. They use a lot as a divider. The second divider that they use, guys, is also 100. With it goes 100 amps or less. These guys are more than 100 amps. These are all you are listing. For example, I have a 400 amp switch gear. 400 amp switch gear. 400 amp, no, switch here, 400 amp panel. And I need to size a conductor for that. And the conductor is CHHL. I don't know what the logs are. Where's your default? 400 amp, 75. So let's go to 400 amp, gentlemen. Go all the way to 75. Can you guys find me? Whatever the conductor is. Because it's so that will be your 600. That will be your 600. They use 500. I'll tell you why they use 500, but. They use 500? Yeah. With 400 amp. Yeah. There's the rule. We'll get into that one, guys, when we reach it. Okay. Now, if you, I'm not going to do it now, but if, if your temperature is different, you ask me about your temperature. If your temperature is different, if you guys go highlight this table right before, here's the temperature table that you use right here. Highlight this. Now, if you're in Arizona and your temperature, oops, and your temperature is different, what would you do? That's how you adjust for temperature. And we will be using this one, guys. Uh, my temperature is. So, do me a favor. Um, let's take an example. Quick, clarify this one. Let's suppose that I have a conductor um, number one of T H H N. Okay, and it's in Arizona, and the ambient temperature, ambient temperature equal 115 degree Fahrenheit. How much current can I pull out of this conductor? So do me a favor. Can you guys go to 
go to the table that we just table V tail dot 15 V16 under 90 degree column. How much current number one up can carry under 90 degree column? How much? 170. 170. Yeah. Now, Patrick is telling me, why, Chad, why did you go to 90 degree, Chad? You told us you can't go to 90 degree. Thank you. We are deviating. Okay, if we're not deviating, can we use this 170? Okay, if we're not deviating, what would the amp be? 75. Go to 75. 150. 150 amp. This is how much this conductor can carry under a normal operating condition. Only 150. But when we derate, they allow you to start with a bigger amp. So you can cut, 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 and not. If you start with a lower amp and you start cutting, you're screwed up. Can you guys see that? Why they allow you to use the 170 instead of 1.5? So when you cut, 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 you still have, you're hovering around 150, which is a normal operating for this conductor. Let's go apply it. So the ambient temperature, the insulation is 90. Here's the 90. Why do you think I'm going to highlight the 90? Because the insulation is here, cha cha. That's 90, right? All right, let's look at the ambient temperature. The ambient temperature is 115. Okay, look at the current now. 115 joule, and that will put me where? Right here. This is from what? I'm telling you, we have an ambient temperature 115. <laughs> okay? Can you see where these numbers come? Now cross-reference with these two numbers, what do you get? 0.82. That's your derating factor. So what does that mean? Okay, no problem. This means you take 170, do the math for me, will you? And cut it by 0.82 because of the ambient temperature. We're going to lower the amp so it doesn't burn. Can somebody do that? What's the, what's the calculation? 82 of 170? 139.1 amps. Do we have a second? 139.1? 4. 4. 4. 4. 4. 4. 4. 4. 4. 4. 4. 4. 4.4. 4.4. 4.4. 4.4. 4.4. 4.4. 4.4. 4.4. 4.4. 4.4. 4.4. 4.4. 4.4. 4.4. 4.4. 4.4. 4.4. 4.4. 4
You are engineers, guys. If your electricians are go deeper, even than that, because they test them on there. Engineering firms, they always default to THX chain slash THW. That's your default installation. Yes. <laughs> or you only can carry 72.5 amps. What's the difference between the one? Between the one between 2B and 2A? Ah. 2A is for normal conductors that 90% of you are going to use. The um, 2B, I'm going to go all the way to 2B. Here you go. 2B, can you guys see the 2B right here? 2B are for special high temperature conductors. Let's not talk about them today. They make conductors. I want to show you. Look at the insulation that they use. We are familiar with 60, 75, and 90, right? This is go all the way to 150 to 200, 250. Now, we normally don't size. They use them guys if you have a furnished room. And you want to bring cable to a furnished room very hot. They use a very special insulation that's rated for a very high temperature. And and this these it doesn't go with this table, by the way. This goes, look at the ambient temperature, they size it based on ambient temperature of what? 40. So so not 60, not 30 like the others. So these this this table goes with this very, very special tables um, for high temperature conductors. So ignore it for the time being, shall we? Okay, now I'm going to go to the second one, guys, so we know how to use that one. Let's go to this bundle. Um, this is another table I'd like you guys to highlight. We're talking about electricity here. Negative electricity chip, which, which is good because it's all good. So we need to go there. Good. So you don't have to worry about it. Uh, you actually can increase the temperature, but we typically, as engineers, we don't hold more conductors than 310 or 15 can allow you the default. But yeah, if you look at the rating factors, very good point. If it's very, look at this. What happens if I'm in uh, Alaska or any place where the temperature is lower? Look at this. Oh, this is not the table I want. I'm going to go to the table that, here, look at this. What happens if I have a freezer? Inside the freezer, the conductor R, and it's 50 or less. You gain intensity. Can you see that? You gain intensity. I don't think I don't know if any engineer can use that. Typically, we you know, don't don't add more intensity. So the cutoff typically, well, yeah, <laughs> the cutoff here. Can you see the cutoff right here? This is your cutoff. Um, so that that's when you start losing. If you stay within this temperature. Like 26 to 30 degree or 78 to 86, you don't lose your gain, right? Exactly the same. Can you see that? You go, if you go colder, colder adding so the conductor can't carry more amp with it. You know that, but don't size guys on this. Absolutely. Leave it 100%. Why? Because it's safer, still safer. Yeah. Okay, if the temperature is lower than the ambient temperature, you start getting more amps <laughs> instead of losing amps. So a conductor that can give you, for example, a conductor that can give you, um, if you have this temperature, a conductor that can give you one amp, now all of a sudden it starts giving you uh, 150, 1.5, 115 amps. I, yeah, uh, you know, it, you, it gets you, look at them, most of them. Well, it gets you a gain of what? So it looks like if you, typically we're at this insulation. So in this installation, you start gaining 15 percent. You gain 15 percent on feeders. So 15 percent amps on feeders. That's a max. I don't think I don't know of anybody who uses them. <laughs> okay. Now, what happened if you if you decided to group the conductors? Please highlight this table. I'm going to grab it. Where is it in here? This is called grouping. Um, now. I like this table, and how do you use this table? You use this table, remember that 3 to 15 B16, that, that twin series told you guys, that um, if you put more than three hots in a conduit or a cable, you have to do it. Okay, so what happens here, I grab all these conductors, and I have uh, my white set here, and another set here. I have um, 
more productive, stay productive, stay content productive. And I'm sorry to say a BBC convert, like we do, it costs. It costs. It accommodates. So, uh, what do you do? These are things that tell. Look what happens. So, let's use a couple of things. By the way, guys, use these for bread circuits. You'll be cool to use them for pizzas. I mean, imagine having a pizza, two pizzas in one pocket. Can you do it? Yes. Should you use it? Definitely not. We group brain circuits only for receptacles and light switch. Even brain circuits that go to the corner, a good engineering design will have a dedicated pipe going to it. Air handling unit, chillers, these big things, just one pipe, one circuit going to it. The only place, good place for grouping is when you do receptacles and lights. Am I kidding you? I'm not saying that's the good way of doing it. Grouping, receptacles, and lights. Okay, so these are number 12. So I have number 12, guys. Number 12, T H H M. Can you guys find uh, uh, on the 90 degree column? How much current number 12 on a 90 degree column can carry, John? 30 amps. 30 amps. Now you just told us, Chad, number 12 cannot carry more than 20 amps, right? We're too late. Okay, so here's my 30 amps. I have how many how many conductors carry current right now? Eight. Eight. Okay. So here's eight. Let's look at all. Here's eight. So you need to do it by what? Seven percent. So you take the thirty and you cut it by point seven. What do you get? What's seven percent of thirty, Jonah? How much? Where's your calculator, guys? So do you guys want an A or you want an A? <laughs> How much? Twenty. One amps. Oops. There's one little problem though. Twenty-one amps. Can I? Can number twelve carry them more than twenty? So this, because of the smaller conductor rule, this turned into what? Twenty amps. What this tells you guys, you can group eight hots in conduit and you you lose nothing. Do you see how how, how good that is? I can group eight conductors hot. Typically, we don't. There, th three of them are hot and one neutral. So there will be six of them, six hot phase and two neutrals, common neutral. You can put them in one uh, all conduit, and you have lost nothing. Why? Because number twelve is limited to twenty amps anyway. Now let's go more than that, John. Let's go and another circuit. I have it number four. Yes, sir. Ah, oh, that's what's limited to. Remember, number 12, guys, the small conductor rule is limited to what? 20. Take more than 1 and 20. So I grabbed the number 4 conductors, gentlemen, and I put them right into that pipe. How many do I have now? I have 12. Okay, look how cool you would be to have that other set. Okay, now 12. Where are we with 12, John? We're right here now. 50. My God, 50. You lose half of your amp if you put 12. Half of your amps. Okay, let's use it. Here, I have 30 multiplied by 50. What do you get? 15 amps. Bad news. Now your 20 amp circuit, now your conductor, how are you going to do away with that? You're going to take a 15 amp here, and this conductor will be number 12, and the load cannot be more than 15 amps. Is this a good idea? Bad idea. Do you guys see the gravity of adding another set of wires? Right here, another four wires hot. So that's why a lot of engineering press have been specified as no more than six circuits, which basically gives you eight current carry conductors, because three phase common um, neutral. Right? When you have a in a three phase system, guys, you have three phase and a neutral. That's called one three phase circuit. Four conductors. And another three phase and neutral, another four, they'll give you eight. So here you go. Uh, the six is the hots. Six hots, uh, six phases, and uh, two neutrals. The neutral will be considered carrying current because they're feeding harmonic loads. We'll talk about this later too. But anyway, so remember, you only need two, six circuits in a pipe. You put more than six circuits in a pipe, six one amp circuit, what do you need to do? Drop the load. Any comments, any questions about this? Now another pool would do, 
is cut there and make this CW. Okay, how much current is over the CW, gentlemen? Number 12 of the CW. That will give me huh? 20 amps. Okay. Now, I want to do the V, the fullest. I have 20 amps, and I want to group for 12 of them, like this. Okay, so 20 amps, that is by 0.5, 10 amps. So now you're going to drop the 15 amps, go, go buy yourself a special fuse, fuse and fuse it at 10 amps. Does it make sense? That's why we use the HHF. Okay. So that's what I'm going to go guys over today with you. Highlight these ones. Shall we have a five minutes break and then I'll um, continue? And I promise you I will shut up at exactly uh, 9.30. We'll start and then we'll talk again. Cool? Let's take five minutes, will you? Thanks. Um, now moving on, remember I, I only have half an hour, so you're going to give me my half an hour. Or I will, guys, call my lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's talk about laying out receptacles on lights in a house. Very simple, very easy, straightforward, no calculation needed. Um, you're going to hear when you do general lighting in dwelling, you're going to have something called general use receptacles. They're general use receptacle outlets. And they're sacred cow outlets. A sacred cow outlets like in the kitchen, in the laundry, and bathroom. These are need their own dedicated circuits. Everything else is general purpose receptacle. So we'll talk about this one guys. So there will be general use receptacles, and there will be the 20 amp receptacles, um, 20 amp brand circuit. They're called small appliances brand circuit. So we'll talk about these one guys in details. Now, how do you find how many general purpose lighting and receptacles you need in a house? Very simple. Do me a favor, go to table 220.12, please, 220.12. The NBC code book we have been here, guys. The NBC code book allocated uh, 30 volt amperes square foot. 30 volt amperes square foot, okay? If you guys look at the table under dwelling, you can see that they allocate 30 amp, um, uh, I'm sorry, 30 volt amp per square foot for a building. So how do we use, you use this value, uh, Brandon, to find, so size the feeders, the service, as well as the brand circuits. All these using that three, vo three volt amp per square foot. How do they use it? Okay, suppose that um, Brandon is a rich guy. And he has a 10,000 square foot house. 10,000 square foot house, okay? So there's 10,000 square foot house. Okay, now you multiply this 10,000 square foot house by three. Where did the three come from, John? That gives you 30,000 volt amp. Where did the three come from? Three per volt amp. Thank you, three per square foot. So you need 30,000 uh, kVA, okay? That's from the get go. Then, now, how many brand circuit do you need for his house? Look at that. Now, these are general purpose brand circuit. You use this value for the load cal and also for the brand circuit. Look how we do it for the brand circuit. All right, so the first thing you do, you take the 30K and divide this by 20, 20 volts, okay? So this is called the amp. How many amps? Okay, the amps. Uh, can somebody give me um, divide uh, 30,000 by 120, please? 6,000, 6,000, 6,000 volt amp, right? Uh, 6,000 amp, actually. 6,000 amp, what am I right here? 6,000 amp. So 30,000 divided by 120, by 120. Is this 120? That's all I think. You're going to fill that, you're going to fill that. Cancel that. 30,000 divided by 120. Now that's like it. 250 even. And 450 amps. Okay, so that's step number one. Step number two, gentlemen, very easy, very simple. You take your 250 and divide it by. Okay, general purpose brand circuits are either 15 or 20. 99% of the time, they will be 15 amps. These are for your lights and general purpose receptacles. Divide this by 15. Why did I divide by 15, gentlemen? Well, the brand circuits are 15. So 250 divided by 15 is what? 
How many brands are in that? Okay, so I'm going to see the .7 uh, circuit. Now, they don't make 16.7 circuits, so that would, that, what would that be? No, 16.7, not, no, this is not, uh, yeah, this is a number of circuits, not the size of the circuit, I'm sorry. So that would be 17 circuits, <laughs> circuits, 15 amps each. Can you just see how we do the math? Very simple. You take the square foot, multiply by 3, divided by 120 because the voltage is 120, divided again by 15 because the circuit rating is 15. So my friend Brandon is going to have 17 circuits, 15 amp each, to feed the following. All the lights in your house, all the general purpose receptacles. Now there are other special circuits that would be added to it. Okay. Now in addition to the 17 that he's going to have for all his lights and all his receptacles. Right. In addition to this, count the following. He needs one more circuit. You need two circuits for the kitchen receptacles. So we need two circuits for kitchen. So now we are up to what? 19. We need one circuit for bathroom. Yeah. Now we're up. Now these are have to be 20 amps. Though. 20 amps. These are, have to be 20 amps. Now we are up to what? 17, we're up to 20. Then we need one circuit, also 20 amp, to laundry. Laundry. So now we're up to what? 21. And now we need one circuit for garage. Let's change it to 2015, uh, 2014. So now we're up to what? 22. Yes, sir. Oh, then you have two options. Either you feed them all from one circuit or one dedicated circuit, which would be the best result. Okay? The garage needs a 20 amp circuit now as of, of 2014. One. The garage. So we need two for the kitchen, 20 amp, one for the bathroom, 20 amp, and one for the laundry, 20 amp, but one for the garage. 15 or 20 amp for the garage. <laughs> two outlets, yeah. Yeah, two outlets. Well, it's actually one outlet per car, car stall. So if you have a two-car garage, you need two outlets in the garage. If you have a three-car garage, you need three outlets. Four-car garage, four outlets. More than that, you're on your own. <laughs> no. So they go one receptacle per stall. That was changed in 2011, and you need a dedicated circuit for that still, garage. It's still one circuit for the garage. One circuit for the garage, feed all the receptacles and the lights. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Now, do you guys know all these circuits? Now, Jay, what happens if you have an AC? Now, if the guy wants to cool his house, what would you do for an AC? Now, remember what's the circuit for the AC? What size circuit? We talked about this one. Yeah. 30 amps. So add another 30 amp circuit here. 30 amp for AC. Now. Let's say, what, what if the guy is rich, he want to invite uh, Thanksgiving uh, holidays and host people, and he has a big range, electric range. So what do you do in addition to that one? We're going to go 40 amp range. 40 or 50. 40 or 50. Okay, what else? What else do you need to list off? So we have AC. Now, 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 yeah, if you have a pool, we, now we're going to start the, to heat the pool one circuit, guys, to pump the pool another circuit. These are special. But there's one circuit every house has to have. Um, how do you circulate the air in your house? Using what? And in your house. Now, air handling in Dunwoody. <laughs> you have an air handling in your house, you're rich. <laughs> uh, furnace. Did you guys forget the furnace? The furnace, that, did you say it? Sorry. Now the furnace, <laughs> you, the furnace must have a dedicated circuit by itself, 15 amp. So that's 15. So 15 amp furnace. Okay, that's it. That's all the circuits that you need in a dwelling. So the, the 30 AC and the 40 amp range, those are the own circuits as well. Yeah, these are dedicated circuits. These are called dedicated circuits. If you have a sump pump, a sump pump, typically we give it a dedicated circuit. A sump pump. 
Oh, thank you. What if you have a water heater? Thank you. If you have a water heater, guys, typically 30 amps water heater. And when I say water heater, uh, Alex, I mean electric water heater, meaning you yeah. burn electricity, not gas. Yeah. Gas ones don't need it. So these are all the circuits that you need, guys. You, we're going to be repeating them over and over as we go through. Okay, so these are your circuits. Um, continuous load. Do you remember the continuous load? They define the continuous load that is here for you. Three hours or more. What did they say? Yeah, three hours or more at full load, though. So if you have a machine that runs at 100 amp, but it's running at 50 amps for three hours, is that continuous load? No. It has to run at 100 amp. It's rated for three hours. Um, now, if you have a fat, fluffy, uh, continuous load, here's the only trick that you do. When you bring a circuit, guys, here's a circuit. My circuit is, let's just say my circuit is a 20 amp circuit. And when I want to have a continuous load here, continuous load, how much current can I pull out of this 20 amp circuit continuously? For safety, they don't want you guys to pull. Okay, let me ask you this. What if that wasn't continuous, non-continuous? The answer should be how much current you can pull out of 20 amp circuit number 12. Remember, that was number 12. Your answer for non-continuous should be 20 amps. Chad, I can pull up to 20 amps. Non-continuous, like receptacles. Now, continuous, thank you. For continuous purposes, you cut it by 28. So you take 28, multiply by 20. That'll get you what? 16 amps. Can you guys get that? So they don't want you to, you see these brand circuits? They don't want you to load these brand circuits continuously more than 80%. Anybody knows why? Safety. Same thing for cables. If your cable can 100, uh, carry 100 amps, if it's continuous load, they don't want you to load it more than 80% of that. So can you guys remember that 80%? If it's continuous load, you always limit the load to 80% of what the circuit is rated for. Any building, any building. Yep, this is continuous load. This will be in for brand circuits in, in uh, 210 and, and 215. Um, I think we're coming into that one too. Okay, yep. Uh, 215, yes. Yep, yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. You got it. Coming out of the main panel, it's up to you. And I could put all of them typically in the main panel. I can put a sub panel in the garage and feed things in the garage. You know. But typically, if you have a 10,000 square foot house, they, they typically have sub panels located somewhere else. Do you guys know why they do sub panels? Anybody can know why do they? Why can't we feed everything from one panel? Can anybody give me one answer? Why can't we feed every single, here at Dundee, why can't we feed all the brand circuits in every single store, store right from one panel in the basement? Okay, so uh, all your eggs in one basket, you drop one, you're dead, That's I buy that one. That's a good, so it's from a reliability point of view, <laughs> one switch wheel blows off, you're dead, you know? Or one circuit trips, you're gonna go to the main and shut the main, so, so not a good idea from reliability, but design wise there's one reason. Money actually is cheaper to put the more than one. Go to job. Go to job. Imagine taking imagine imagine taking this 20 amp circuit that feed all these lights, guys. Look at the light above your head. Imagine taking it from here all the way 150 feet down to the basement. What's gonna happen to the voltage drop? The 120 that you bring from the basement, by the time it reaches here, it will be 80 volts. So that fixture will start dimming, dimming, dimming. I'm telling you, I can't run at this voltage. So what they do is they bring a bigger conductor, bring a voltage higher right up to here, so you'll have two air, and then when you take it from here to here, it's a very short distance. Voltage drop is the main main reason why we have sub panels. Okay. Um, voltages. <clears throat> do me a favor, gentlemen. Can you guys go to 220.50? 220.5. Please highlight that. This will list all the voltages approved by the NEC code. Please highlight them. Uh, 220.5. List all the voltages. They're called nominal voltage. A good example of them is 480 slash 277. 280 slash 120. 240 slash 120. These are the most common. This is repairs 
this is three phase, this is a single phase. Can you guys see, these are the most common voltages that we use in the U.S. Now, if you can see, there are more on that list, but these are the most common ones. German, how much voltage are you going to use? Residential, typically this voltage. Commercial, typically this voltage. Industrial, typically this voltage. That's easy. Industrial, 48277. Commercial, 28120. Residential, 24120. Can I say it typically, please? Because you, they could cross. You can have a dental office running at 24120 single phase. But typical, that's kind of the, I would say that's 80% of the time. That's how we run. <clears throat> Where would you say chronic uh, High industrial plants, uh, refineries. And they're used in, little in the U.S. Even the refineries, guys, we go higher than that. Like the U of M, the campus itself, they're running at 13,800 volts, the whole campus. So they go through the higher voltage. When you have a campus, you want to power a campus. Uh, you don't choose for even 480 with 600. You know, I mean, I yes, yeah, the U of M. Do you know that the U of M consumes probably more power than I would say 50% of the towns in Minnesota, like individually? <laughs> it's a city by itself. The power lines are at 16. The power lines at 13,800 13, is the, the one that we run. A lot of uh, the U of M, 3M. Mayo Clinic, uh, uh, whereas all these um, children, all these uh, campuses, if you have a campus hospital, they run at 13,800. They, they have their own like, supply, like on a bigger line or something? They, yep, they give them one, uh, one, typically one feeder for them, and they have a generator to back it up too. Yeah. What's the residential? The residential is 24120, single phase. 24120. 24120 single phase. Okay, now this these guys are called nominal voltage. What the heck is a nominal voltage? Name. This is just the name. So if you physically go to a voltmeter and go measure the voltage, would you like it to find it exactly 240? No, you might find it 241, 242, 243. It hovers around plus or minus 5% of this value. Can you guys highlight the utilities are supposed to maintain plus or minus 5% of these values? Of the nominal, they call it nominal voltage. Okay. So the utility are required at the service to keep you within five plus or minus five percent. Now what's 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 wrong with go lower? Voltage drop. If the utility is giving you a voltage screwed up at the service, how are you gonna fix it in your building? That's why the utility guys pump up the voltage at the service. If you go measure the voltage of the service, they give you instead of like if your voltage is 24120, that you will find it 244 at the service, 123 at the service. So as you pull the grand circuit in your building, you have enough voltages to drop. You know. Okay, so these are very, very important voltages, guys. All right, moving away from the voltages. Um, rules for calculating. We calculate the the the, the stuff, guys, for you here. Um, you calculate for the dwelling based on the square foot. We did that. Um, minus, okay. Now, when you do the square foot for the building, you do a couple of minuses, um, the square foot. Here's a couple of things that you have to subtract. For example, if you have a porch in your house that we calculated, the porch, the branded porch, that porch, do you take the square foot of it and add it? No. Porch, the square foot for the porch, remember his house, the 10,000 square foot, that does not include the porch. Or... The garages are not included. Yes, sir. Now we're coming. Um, finished or finished or can be finished in the future. Adaptable to be finished in the future. Yes, sir. Um, a pool house or a boat house. That's a completely. That's not well. That's a house for your, you know, now you're going to calculate it based on the actual load that you're feeding in it. You're going to allocate 100, like how many receptacles, how many lights. You do the math. So every receptacle, 180 volt amp, and the lights, typically we allocate 180 volt amp for the lights. You do a separate calculation for them. Yes, sir. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right. So for the house, you drop the porch, you drop the garage. Unfinished space, not used for, or cannot be adaptable for future use. So if you have a basement, unfinished basement, you must include it. 
but the portion where you have the laundry area and, and uh, you know the mechanical equipment area, the furnace, can you adapt this for future use and make it a bedroom right where the furnace is? Typically not. So the portion that you cannot adapt for future use, typically where the furnace is located, the mechanical equipment, that's excluded. Everything else in the basement can be adaptable for future use, right? Can make it a house. So it should, it should be included. So unfinished basement portions that can be adapted for future use to be rooms and play areas must be included. Uh, how about if you have a crawl space under your, build, under your house? No, not included. Okay, so you just, yes, sir. So do you do an add on? Do you have to redo everything? Uh, if you know you're going to add on in the future, you have to take this into consideration. That's called okay. future planning. Right. If you already have it for what you have, and then you add on, you have to redo everything for the, for the part that you, you add on. You do the calculation for the part you add on. Make sure you don't exceed the service, though. Typically, in dwelling, you don't have problem. If you have a 20 amp circuit, guys, unless you have a 10,000 square foot house, which most of us have, a house between 200, 2,000 and 4,000, right? I would say 80% of the people, am I right? Between 2,000 square foot and 4,000, 5,000 maybe square foot. If you have a 200 amp panel, done. You don't need to go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The minimum. <laughs> <laughs> the 5,000? The 5 or the no, uh, 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 yeah. Well, <laughs> but there are homes that's 10,000, guys. Okay, minimum number of grand circuits. This is what I did the calculation for his house, guys. We did the math for his house. Exactly the steps. First, you multiply by 103 uh, volt amp. Then you divide by 120. Then you divide by 50. These are the steps that we did, right? The steps that we did a second, uh, we found 17 circuits for his house. Track lights. What happens if, if he has a track lights in his house? You don't add anything for track lights in dwelling. By the way, if non-dwelling, non-dwelling you do. But dwelling, remember when we did the math last week, we, we added track lights. For non-dwelling, you have to add volt amps. For dwelling, you don't. So no, the track lights are included in the three volt amps. You have a, uh, how do you describe it? Uh, a track and has lights and you can adjust. I have a picture of it. Yeah. 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 If you have a track light, which here's the track light with heads here, okay, um, you can't, the load cannot exceed what the track light is holding for. So if, if you're feeding it from a 20 amp, obviously you, anything that you put here shall not exceed 20 amps. So it says you can't exceed what the track light is loaded for. Small appliances brand circuit, that's a name must, you guys must ring in your ear all the time. The small appliances brand circuit, these are two circuits dedicated to the kitchen. They call them small appliances. Two circuits dedicated to the kitchen, okay? Um, what they do for them, they allocate 100 and 1500 volt amp uh, for each circuit, as well as for the laundry circuit, as well as for laundry circuit. Now, in addition, now remember, these are dedicated circuits, 20 amp each. So I have two of them here and one for the laundry. When you size your service, when you size your service, for brand circuits, it's easy. Two circuits here, 20 amp. These are 20 amp, 20 amp each, right? Here and here. Two here and one here. For brand circuits, we're done. For feeders and services, for feeders and services, you have to take the 1500 multiplied by 2 and 1500 multiplied by 1 and add it to the 10,000 square foot times 3. Yes, yes, sir. That's when. Because you said the bathroom, what if you have a, it's a powder room in the general use? Yes, there is a powder room in this area. Typically, a uh, powder room in this case, they didn't consider it general use. There's some, you know, there's certain rooms, guys. My son in law has a gun room, for example, and powder room or whatever. If you have a function, Office, and you you know this is going to be an office, you have to allocate a dedicated circuit to it. 
these are general general house as sleeping area play area sitting area bathroom and kitchen that's what general house is you know now if you have other than that you start going dedicated circuit okay all right so here's your 20 amp so the 20 amp for the small appliances guys can feed only the kitchen or the pantry or the dining room or the breakfast area now can i or similar areas can i take the 20 amp circuit and go feed the receptacle outside no not legally the bathroom receptacle, it's a circuit, the 20 amp bathroom circuit. Can you take the 20 amp bathroom circuit and go feed a receptacle in the living room? No. Bedroom, no. Dedicated, these are common sacred cows. I call these circuit sacred cows. The laundry circuit, the bathroom circuit, and the two small circuits in the kitchen, 20 amp each, four circuits. These are four circuits. These and the garage, five circuits, 20 amp each, two in the kitchen, one in the bathroom. One in the laundry and one in the garage. 20 amp each. They have to be 20. The garage can't be 15, though. These are dedicated cows, the sacred cows. They can't feed anything outside these areas. Yes, sir. So that 4,500 is added to the 30? Yes. Yep. Absolutely. But but then you don't you don't do the math on it because the branch circuit already sorted. We add them when we size the feeder and the service. Guys, all these numbers are used in two things. Remember. We need to size feeders and services and branch circuits. For branch circuits already sized. Here, 220, 220 here, and 120 here. Done. Now, how about the feeder and the service? Feeders, we don't have a feeder. But how about the service? That's where this becomes a big deal for sizing a service. So you multiply, you add these two numbers to the 30K to size your service. We will be doing it, guys, for the house. You'll see. We'll, I'm going to go over these in details. It's going to be repetitive, guys, a lot for you. Is there like a step-by-step? Yes. I do have one step-by-step. Step. You guys are going to be doing it for the residential. I'll walk you through step-by-step step, how to size service. But what I would like you to pay attention here more, not the service, but the branch circuits. Pay a little bit of attention to the branch circuits. So where we need the branch circuits. Okay, moving with the branch circuits. Uh, 20 amp small appliances shall not supply any other outlets. Remember, these are circuit cows. We talked about the circuit cows. Um, okay, so 220. So where do I need to have 220 amp circuits? I need two for the kitchen. Here's two. I need one for the bathroom. I need one for the laundry and one for the garage. How many rooms do we end up with? Five circuits. Actually, four 20 amp, and one the garage can be 15 or 20. All, all other receptacles will be what? 15 amp. Let's go over the circuits one more time. 20 amp circuits, where do I need them? Two in the kitchen, one in the laundry, one in the bathroom, four of them. I need a dedicated 15 amp circuit for the garage or 20. I need a dedicated circuit 15 amps for, thank you, furnace. Uh, range, water heater, yep, uh, AC, these are all dedicated circuit with the amps. Sump pump, dedicated circuit for the sump pump. Laundry and 50 and 20. Laundry 20. Yes, sir. Yeah. We got a, my dad's house actually, he's got a burnt out receptacle and a burnt out the lights in the dining room right next to the laundry room. I think that's on the same. Where's the receptacle? It's on the wall, and like the, that's the wall separating the living room from the Yes, room. they must have stole the power to feed the laundry and the dining room. But the one in the, the dining room already, that's probably enhanced or something. The dining room, well, remember, a lot of homes guys have been grandfathered in. Yeah, but typically, the dining room and the kitchen have to be dedicated 20 amp circuits at least. Now, you can have more, but at least. 20, two 20 amp circuits feeding all of them. You can have five 20 amp circuits if you want to. Minimum. Minimum two. That's okay. Yeah, that's okay. You can have um, you can have uh, a dedicated circuit for the lights in the in the dining room. You have to have in the dining room or the laundry. For the laundry, you have to have in the dining room. The dining room you have to have in the dining room or the laundry. You have you can you can have a dedicated circuit on the laundry uh, for the lights, for example. But the laundry circuit have to feed the receptacle of the laundry. That's just dedicated to the laundry receptacles. They did, they did other shoddy work on the house, so yeah. I think it's probably not a totally function. Yeah. So, but these are <laughs> these are the rules. Good. Does this include uh, outside receptacles? Uh, yes. 
A calculation for outside receptacle. Right? Yes. Yes. The two receptacles. Uh, the pump to one end, yes. Okay, so these are the brand circuits. Let's talk a quick, guys, about the minimum rece required receptacles. We have duplic receptacle. You guys are looking at it right there. The way they do the duplic receptacles are, um, there are two rules. Can you guys write it down? Rule number one, it's called 6 by 12. I call it 6 by 12 feet. 6 by 12 feet rule. Every habitable room, guys, every habitable room. What is a habitable room? Kitchen, uh, living room, family room. That's called habitable room. Um, you go from the door. Look at this, how you measure it. You go from the door, measure this distance. This distance six feet with the first receptacle. <laughs> and then 12 feet, the second, 12 feet, the second, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12 all around until, say, this is the door. Until you reach that door, make sure you're not further than six feet away. That's called six by 12 rule. Rule number two, six feet from the opening, a door. Yeah, now window, a door. The second one is two feet wall. <clears throat> if you have a two feet wall, guys, any two feet standalone wall need how many receptacles? One receptacle. And any habitable room. <clears throat> That's the second rule. Uh, hallway, three. Hallway needs one receptacle. One receptacle. If the hallway, if, but the hallway, if it's 10 feet or more. If you have a 10 foot or more hallway, you need one receptacle. If you have a 100 feet hallway, how many receptacles do you need? One. It's it, one receptacle if the hallway is more than 10. 10 or more. If it's 10 or more, one receptacle. So it could be a thousand feet. No, that's ridiculous. Doesn't need any. Doesn't mean you can't put, guys. Remember, these are minimum. You are, you're you're gonna use your judgment. I typically, when I design, if it's my house, I'll put one. If it's your house and I'm doing it to, to the code, I wouldn't. <laughs> so being designers, you always push higher than the code. So every hallway put a receptacle, but the code says every 10 feet. So there's no rule that says in a hallway that's 100 feet, it needs a certain number. There's a rule of thumb in industrial that in commercial we use every 25 feet we put a receptacle in hallways. That's a, that's commercial. So typically, why 25 feet? If you have an extension cord, you don't want more than 25 feet. So every 25 feet you put a receptacle. That will give you like two and a half, a 12 and a half feet extension cord to clean and what's not. That's a typical they use in commercial, 25 feet. In residential. I mean, if you have a 20-foot hallway, I would put two receptacles in it, personally. But code, one. Can you explain the two-foot wall again? I didn't catch that. Okay, the two-foot wall, it goes like this. Here's a, here's a room. Here's a door. Here's a door. Here's a door. And here's a door. Okay? So you go from this area, from this door. Oh, my God, this is, I'm way off. From this door, six feet. And you put your receptacle right here. Then go around to here. Make sure you're not more than six feet again. You can this receptacle cannot be more than six feet from this door or this door. Alright? So don't look at come over here. Here's another say it's six feet right up to here, six feet. You need one receptacle here. Um, and also make sure from here to here is not more than six feet. So you come, look at this door. You come from this edge, six feet was the first receptacle. And then keep going on the same wall, 12 feet, 12 feet, 12 feet, until you hit the longer door. When you reach that door, make sure you're not further than six feet away from that second door. What if you write two foot? Two foot. Yeah, the two foot wall. Two foot. Oh, the two foot wall. Oh, the two foot wall. That's what I did. Oh, I'm sorry. Here's a wall. There's a door right here. And this wall and there's another door right here and there's two doors and this is a three foot wall in between the two doors how many receptacles do you need one if it's two foot wall or more you need a receptacle typically typically smaller walls between doors if it's a one foot foot wall do you need a receptacle one foot no i would though in certain areas it's really nice to have that receptacle so, but code-wise, you don't. Know.
Does that make sense? Yeah, so that's if it's under six feet distance, right? Like the distance between those two doors is less than six feet. Yes, then you apply that. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Typically, when it's six, yeah, between two doors, you have less than six feet distance. Yeah, up over two, you put over two, you put one. Okay, so these are all the rules for receptacles. Uh, third rule, four. Uh, outside, outside, back and front, back, front, uh, receptacle, and receptacle. The code requires you guys to put one receptacle in the back, one in the front of a dwelling house. That's it. Garage. So these are uh, number five. Garage. Garage. You need one pure uh, uh, saw. One pure garage saw. So if you have two car, uh, two car, uh, two car garage, how many you need? Two. Unfinished basement. Six. Unfinished basement. Unfinished basement. How many? One receptacle for unfinished basement. Six. Seven. Bathroom. Bathroom. Room. How many? One receptacle for the bathroom. Laundry area. Eight. Running out of space. Unfinished basement, one receptacle. Okay. Uh, seven is bathroom. And you apply the rules of six to over there. The countertop of the kitchen. Nine. Counter top of kitchen. Counter top of the kitchen. Here's the rules, gentlemen. Two by four feet. Here's your countertop. There's your sink. You go from here. Two feet, you put receptacle, and from here, two feet. So every two feet from every opening and four feet in between. And if, you're, if your sink goes all the way to this, then you measure from here to here. Here's another receptacle, two feet, four feet, receptacle, and then from here to here, two feet. Yes, sir. Is that any countertop with wet bar? No, this is only kitchen countertop. They all have to be GFCI. Thank you. In the kitchen, countertop receptacles have to be GFCI, as well as the bathroom, as well as the laundry, if it's within six feet, laundry receptacle, um, within six feet of any sink, have to be GFCI. So, like, two feet, seven, four feet, three feet, mm -hmm. four feet. Absolutely. Uh, if the distance from here to here, this, the rule is four in between, two from every opening. So here's the edge, two, four in between, from here to here is two, two, and from here is here to two. Four in between, two from the edges. Yes, yes. Any point to the wall, you have to be two feet. So, look at, look at, if I get, if this is my countertop, it starts right here. Two feet, put the first step. Now, four feet, four feet. Now, when you reach this four feet, get sure you are not further than two feet from here. If this from here to the same, same right there. So, I need to take it three feet, and I'm right here at four feet. I need to put another one here. If I'm from here, <clears throat> from two feet or less, I'm good. If this is three feet, what do you need to do? Another step. And then you jump to this side, <coughs> two feet here, four feet, four feet, four feet, to come to this other thing for the range. Are you within two feet? You're good. More than two feet, what do you do? Five or five. So you have to be 
and four feet in between. Okay. <clears throat> so these are your rules, gentlemen, for your receptacles. Um, here's the rules, guys, 24. And uh, now, what happened if your if your countertop is 12 inches, just one tiny little countertop, four inches or more, one receptacle. Remember that two feet wall like we talked about? That's exactly like the two foot wall. If it's a countertop, if you have a one foot wall on the countertop, you need one receptacle at least. How about if you have a kitchen, guys? Uh, if the countertop, uh, countertop is uh, uh, 24 inches by one inch, like peninsula or island, you need one receptacle for that too. GFCI. Uh, the following. Anything within six feet of a sink, guys, within six feet of a sink, you have to be GFCI. Any sink, if you have receptacle within six, six feet of the kitchen sink, the bathroom sink, the laundry sink, and uh, the bar sink that you have in your basement, uh, Patrick, <laughs> any any receptacle, 15, 20, have to be GFCI. Okay, where else do I need GFCI? Old bathroom receptacle, GFCI. Laundry. Laundry area, GFCI. Outdoor receptacle, GFCI. Unfinished basement, GFCI. How about garage? Garage receptacle, GFCI. How about the kitchen countertop? All the receptacles on the countertop. Guys, if you want to guess for GFCI, guess any place they have water. Any place that has water have to be GFCI. Bathroom, laundry, think about it. Unfinished basement, damp or wet. Uh, garage, you know, you could make it wet there in Minnesota and all this good stuff. Uh, outdoor, uh, the refrigerator can be, the refrigerator does not have to be, it's optional to have a dedicated circuit for it, but it's optional. But you can put it on a 220 amp circuit for it. Yes. It's dual. Okay, so these guys, the GFCI, all the GFCI unfinished basement, 20 amp, run circuit for each bathroom. At least shall be installed in the front and the back. We talked about these one. Here's your receptacle in the front and the back. So you guys see one in the front, one in the back. Um, okay, receptacle. And the last thing I want to talk about, guys, is lights. That's all the receptacle. Very easy in the brand circuit. Lights. I, I could not find a better way of describing lights than this picture, guys. The light requirement in a house. Okay, let's start with right here. Do you need a light in the bedroom? How many? One. At least one. Can you put 15? Can you not? Do you need a light in the hallway? Yes, at least one. In bathroom? Yes. Stairway? Only if you have six steps or more. Now, how dumb is that? <laughs> if your stairway is, is less than six feet, uh, not, not, I'm sorry, six steps. If your stairway is four steps or five steps, no light. But if you make it six steps, um, you need a light, I'm sorry, the, the, the six step rule is for three way switches. You need a light. You need a light either way. But the, if you have six steps or more, you need a switch at the top and a switch at the bottom. Thank you. All right, how about the uh, habitable area? Any habitable area? Yep. Yeah. How about the uh, utility room? Yep. Yeah. How about the uh, stairway again? Uh, basement? Yep. Yeah. All these need. How about the outside service door for the garage? Yes. How about the, the garage door inside the garage? You need a light. Um, the, door, the outdoor, the outdoor of the house, you need a light. Am I making sense then? This summarizes all the light requirements. Now, the white one, can you see the white one? It looks like light outlet must be wall switch control. Wherever, now there are two ways of turning the light on and off. The smart way is to put the switch on the wall and turn it on and off, right there, right? The switch was right there. Right there. That's on the wall. The non-smart way is to go jump to the light and pull it with the chain, pull chain. <laughs> right? You've seen them in the basement all the time. Now, there's certain location you must have a wall, a wall switch. Where are these locations? You're looking at it. Here. Here, all the white ones require you to have a switch on the wall. So if you're in the bedroom, the hallway, bathroom, kitchen, or the also included habitable area, which is like your habitable room, kitchen, all these require you to have what? Switch on the wall. 
Now, where can you have a full chain? Grace, can you have a, a full chain? Yep. How about storage area? Utility room, you see them. these are okay to have a chain on the light and put. So typically basement and utility room and under floor space, right? Which is not commonly used. You can see not, you just walk in rarely there and cold chain. Other than that, you need a switch. Okay, with you. Um, now the permanent system with six, if you have six steps or more, has more than six steps, then you need a switch here and a switch here for these things. You need two switches, one switch here and one switch here. If you have on the stairway, the light that lit the stairway, if you have more than six steps, they require you to have a three-way switch. You guys are familiar with three-way switch. You turn it from two locations. Only if you have six steps or more. Yes, sir. That's it? Okay. Six steps or more, you require three-way switch. Um, now, in the habitable room, guys, except uh, they have an exception here, remote control, outdoor. You can have put remote control on these two, that's acceptable, the outdoor. You don't have to have a switch, you can have an optimizer sensor for the outside door, turn on and off by yourself. That's okay. Um, now, for other than the kitchen and the bathroom, remote control, blah, 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 blah. other than the kitchen right here, other than the kitchen and the bathroom, other than kitchen and bathroom, guys, you can have an outlet. I hate that. Don't you guys hate that? When you have in a bedroom, you look and there's no lights in the ceiling, said, what the heck? And they have an outlet that turn on and off. At one time in Minnesota, somebody was fond of switching outlets. My house is the same. First thing I walked in, guys, I went and bought lights in the ceiling. I hate outlet switch. I don't know about you, but so other than the kitchen and the bathroom, you can't switch an outlet for a light. These are the two locations. In any other places, guys, you can put an outlet like this with a table lamp and turn it on and off. <laughs> hate that. Yeah, my house is the same thing. I think at one time in Minnesota, there was there was a bunch of people that loved, like I said, switching outlets. Very popular. Oh uh, yeah, they split the top. They split them one on all the time, one switch. Yeah, but I just don't like table lamps. I don't. I have enough lamp up in the ceiling. It's nice. So, gentlemen, this is a summary of all the lights required. Look at the attic. If your attic is all you need is guys. If your attic is accessible, if your attic is accessible, meaning you have how how would the attic be accessible? You have a permanent ladder. Some attics, I don't know if yours, mine is not, have a permanent ladder that you can pull and you store things in there. That's a permanent. That's accessible. Every attic is accessible, but accessible for storage. Then you have to have a light there, and that light doesn't have to have a switch. You can just pull pull chain on it. Gentlemen, that's all we have for uh, lights. We're going to repeat this one information one more time. I know I could drill, uh, drill you. Let's take 10 minutes uh, break and then get your lunch. And we'll do CAD. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, was I under oath? Was I under oath? Yeah. Next time, I uh, promise I you guys. Say it. Recorded, yeah, it's, it's in the <laughs> But I, uh, was I sworn in? <laughs> 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 That's it. <laughs>